Okay, uh, thank you, Lightroom. So let me try to share my screen quickly. Okay, great. Can everyone see it? Yeah. Yes, we can. And before you start, I'll have to say this, right? Today, we had a, uh, you know, this interaction that we normally have uh, uh, with my colleagues in Rodin to CSC 741. Last week, we were, uh, I was ranting about LaTeX and typesetting, and I, I'm happy to say Zola clearly looks like he used a beamer here to create his slides, which is why they look so beautiful, right? Okay. <laughs> okay, uh, thank you. Um, so thank you again, Lighten. Uh, before I continue, I wanted to mention something now is, so I am affiliated with the Knowledge Engineering Green Team, sorry, which is led by Professor Keat. But I also did want to mention here, I'm also affiliated with the HPI Richard School. Uh, Lighten used to be affiliated with it as well. And I wanna mention something here is a bit of advertising. So if people want to do like a PhD at the next year or in the future, um, there's normally a call every year from the school offering funding. Um, it's very like, it's good funding. I think uh, Lighting would back me up on this. So please, anyone, if ever you want to do a PhD school, sorry, PhD in Cape Town, consider applying for it. Um, so basically, I think most people haven't actually seen what I look like. Um, I would have turned on the, the camera, but unfortunately I'm at home and my lighting is not that great here. So that's what I look like there on the left. Um, I'm sorry, there's a comment now. Uh, is there a problem? Ah. So that's what I look like. Um, again, Lighten did mention that one of the things I'm interested in is NLP, right? NLP. But I do want to like, uh, add like a bit of a caveat here. I, I am interested in natural language processing, but not pretty much for all languages, right? I particularly focus on language that belong here in this area there that's labeled S. It's pretty much the group that Catherine calls the language zone S. Uh, this pretty much include languages from like countries like Botswana, uh, uh, South Africa, Lesotho, etc., like Swaziland as well, and, and I think Zimbabwe as well. Um, I think some of the languages that are spoken in Mozambique and like Zimbabwe for the most part are also spoken in uh, Zambia as well. So again, it doesn't really matter, but that's, uh, those are the languages that I work on. So for today's talk, I'm trying to make it short, right? Because again, I know we don't really have a lot of time together. So I only like, structured it in six parts. So the first thing I'm gonna be doing is pretty much giving you a context to, to like what I do. And I wanna give you a warning here because I'm gonna spend a lot of my time on the context because I feel like it's important to understand like essentially the area in which I work because the other parts might not, not gonna be useful unless you understand what is it that like the, what people do in this area that I'm in. And then once that's clear, I'll just briefly go to the problem and introduce what I call grammar first templates. And then at the end, talk about the classification and show that it's useful by uh, giving you a use case and then finally conclude. Uh, before I continue, by the way, um, if people find it like I'm speaking too fast because I've had complaints before about that, please don't uh, have an issue. Just uh, pop in a message via the, the text box feature there. I'll try to slow down if I can't hear myself if I'm going faster. Um, okay, without further ado, let's continue. So generally, right, one of the things I think people use quite a lot um, pretty much probably on a daily basis without ever realizing it, right, are knowledge organization systems. These are ranging from things like dictionaries or taxonomies. And pretty much all taxonomies are used by ciders, right, because they have to deal in some cases with medical, like with the medical domain. The issue here is that if you were to note, right, it's very intertwined with our lives. It's one of those things where it's like breathing. You never think about it, but it's very important. On the other flip side, however, is that building this thing is something which I actually do think about quite a lot. In particular, I think about how to include the end user or even like the domain experts in how we construct these things and how we maintain them and even like improving their use. The issue, however, is that if one wants to include people who are these end users, right, they don't have formal training in the representations that are used to encode these things, right? So the easiest approach to this, right, is obviously you would think about this. Instead of presenting like a formal representation, how about you translate that formal representation into a language that people already understand? And because some people, like people, pretty much everyone already speaks some natural language, then it makes sense to try to take this formal representation and then translate it into like a natural language. And in particular, this is what people have been doing from quite a lot. But with a small caveat here is that they don't translate formal representations to natural language as a whole. They translate it into a controlled natural language. What that essentially means is that they can only translate the, the formal representation into like a, a fixed natural language. That is, they control the types of sentences that are possible. 
So this allows you to be able to read it, but then it doesn't create a mess because you're not generating all kinds of text. So I'll try to show you what I mean by this, because again, when I talk about formal representations and controlling natural languages, it may sometimes sound like gibberish. So I'll show you with this table what I mean by this is. So there's a, a controlled natural language. Uh, we often call this just C and L, right? So it's C and L instead of just saying control language because it's way too, too exhausting. So there's a CNL called Our Simplified English. It was created by a man called Richard Power in 2012. And the reason why he created it, right, he wanted to present what a language called OWL, which is the web ontology language, right? It's a language for creating ontologies. So it looks something like this. Of course, I think people would agree with me that this, some of these things don't look natural. Are you still with me? Mm -hmm. ah. ah, cool. Sorry, I'm just checking. My internet is not that great here. So sometimes like, I would never notice if you were gone. Okay. Um, so um, essentially, like, uh, our looks like this, right? You have these things that look like functions. You, know, you have subclass of C1 and C2. But the problem is that if you don't really have formal training, right, it's really quite hard to understand what all of this is and what it means. On the flip side, however, is if you look in the rights on the examples, like if you speak English, you clearly understand what in each of these things mean. So what people then, essentially what Power was trying to do is, how do you present this like this? And he was using templates or patterns, as he calls them. They look like this. So in other words, let me show you an example here is, so in the first case, right, what you see is you could have subclass, for C1 you have the value city, for C2 you have the value place. What that means essentially is that a city is a subclass of place. In other words, that's just subsumption, right? Like I think if people have done UML, you understand like inheritance, that is, of, like this concept is, uh, inherits the other one, that is a dog sub, like, um, subsumes animal, that is a dog must necessarily be an animal. So you can, instead of presenting it like with this trippy thing there that looks difficult to understand, you can say A, whatever you are using, so in your case, city or dog, is A place. Very simple, right? That's nice. Um, so I think much more generally though, you don't necessarily need to use the simplest approach to the use of templates. Uh, so generally, the, the approach people use is to take use of, sorry, to make use of methods that fall into what is called natural language generation. So natural language generation, NLG for short, is a domain that sort of lies at the intersection of AI and computational linguistics. And sort of the point of it, right, is to try to produce an understandable text. And this is done from, by taking in like non-linguistic information. So I'll try to illustrate, give you an example of what, how, how this would look like, right? So the, one of the biggest examples or applications of NLG is uh, generation of weather reports from data. So that is, you can have sensors, just say scattered across Zimbabwe, sorry, uh, Zambia, you collect weather readings, and then you're taking those readings, you push it to the machine, and the machine generates a report what the weather looks like, right? That's nice. So essentially what people are doing is taking this, like, methods that I use in this field by using it in the one I just described before, like representing from a language using this, like, uh, natural language, but with this approach. So in this, essentially, in this case, right, you have non-linguistic input. So the input would be these things that look like this, and you want to generate that one. Uh, so... NLG generally has four, like at least in the, 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 time of, the time of this presentation, there are four clusters of approaches one does this, right? So the first one is the use of templates. A template is literally just like a sentence, but with slots, like it has gaps in it. You can fill them in with different things to get text. The second one is the use of grammars. Like you literally build a computational grammar by hand where it's supposed to generate the entire sentence or like everything. So it's responsible for a various number of things. The other approach is to use statistical methods, or the most recent approach is, is what's called the, this, this cluster, this neural approaches. This is not that old, and this is credited, I suppose, is very growing now because of the boom within deep learning. The machine learning people are taking over, introducing these new approaches that are, are, are exciting, right? But then they have their own issues. So what I'm gonna do now is, before we even get to the problem, I, I wanna talk to you about each of these things and how what they look like and what their problems are. And then after we do that, I'll tell you what the best approach would be, and then get to the research program and mention it in. Is that fine? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the first one is templates, right? So a template is like, if you remember the example before, is essentially something that looks like this. It looks like a sentence, but it has slots. So if we were to try to, for instance, verbalize agrovoc, which is like a, it doesn't really matter to be honest with you, but just, just think of it. <laughs> just, well, I'll try to explain this with an example. Don't forget what it is. Um, so. If you have the value maze, but then you have chicha or millipop, right? You can insert this value here in this one on this side. So you can get text that looks like this at the bottom. So you can say, 
maize is used to make millipap. And this is much more, it looks nicer right, like this versus the other ones we had before. Because technically speaking, you can represent this using the, the, the functors we had before, because essentially what we have here, you have an object property ascension. That is, you have the object property make, you have the individual maze, and then the other individual is pop or millipop, right? So instead of doing this thing that looks really, really difficult to understand, you have this nice one where you say, maze is used to make millipop. It looks better. Now, generally speaking here is you can always add chicha or millipop at the same time, right, by having basic rules. So you're going to say, used to make millipop or chicha, which is fine. Now, again, the problem is that languages you would, as like you would imagine, is not this simple. That is, sometimes when you insert something here, that value depends on something there, right? And you can't really encode such things here. That's why this doesn't really work as it is. The second approach is what we were talking about before, is the use of hand-coded grammars. And this is literally going to a grammar textbook. You look at the, all the rules that people like the linguists have like detailed if you have a grammar book in the first place, you try to compute, like you write computational representations of them. So they are responsible for things like agreement, how words should be ordered, how to inflect words, how to do punctuation, all kinds of these things. But then, as we can imagine, right, you have to put this thing into one system. So I have an example here from 2015. This one was written in English as far as I can remember. So it was built to generate uh, descriptions of uh, hotels and I think, oh, sorry, restaurants, not hotels. So you could have, for instance, that X, where X is the name of the restaurant, is a restaurant that offers moderate price range, blah, 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 this sort of text. Now, the issue here is that you literally have to build these things, and it's very good time consuming to do this. And sometimes for the languages that we talked about, the ones that belong into the cl S cluster is, you don't have a book in the first place, like the linguists have not written, like uh, documented the grammar. So if you are a computer scientist or whatever, like you are the person who wants to build these things, you literally, if you have to act as the, the NLP person, but also as the linguist, which is just too much to ask, it's not really feasible. The third approach um, is something called statistical methods, right? There are two approaches to this, but it doesn't matter how they work specifically, right? Let's just say that what they do essentially is they generate candidate sentences, like the possibilities, and then you rank which one is likely. So I have an example of a past tree here. For instance, you have the, I don't know how to read German, so you'll have to forgive me. I would, I would try to read this for you though. Um, so they look things like this. So you have these words which are ordered, right? And then you try to find a way which sentence is likely, and then you use that one. Now, the problem here is that you need a lot of like, a corpus It's pretty much, if people are not familiar with linguistics, it's pretty much a collection of text. So in order to collect these statistics, you need a corpus. And unfortunately, in some cases, is that some languages don't really have such existing corpora like to be able to do this. So this doesn't work. Now, the fourth approach, which is the much more like, which is the exciting one. And it's really, really like, this is like, again, some of these ideas are very old, but then it's been booming now for the past couple of years. So I have an example here that uses like a recurring neural network, but you can also, you can, people also use like different kinds of networks like, like CNNs, for instance. So essentially here, what you have, you require a large amount of data, right? Where you have the text, which is essentially what we'll call the whys here. And then you have the input. So in the case of the weather, you would be the, like the weather readings. So it could be, I don't know, minimum, the number, the maximum, the number, and things like that. So you have to align the data and then train a large neural network to understand the, like the, the relationship between the input and the output. And then you use it to generate the uh, text when given like new or like, unseen output. And the problem here is that you need a lot of data, like a lot to be able to do this. And as, as I mentioned before with the previous ones is that this is not really feasible for the languages that we're working on because you cannot expect to get such data, right? Now, interestingly though, there is an approach, again, to see this is the, the fourth, uh, sorry, the fifth one. The, we, we didn't talk about it before because this is an idea that people have not really been using before, but it's very, it's an idea that it's old. That is in 2005, someone by the name of uh, Van Dimter pointed out that is some templates are not simply just, they don't look like, um, they don't look like this, where you have this linear sentence, right, with just lots. Some of them are much more like complicated because they have rules. So you can have a past tree, but then with the slots in them, right? So this idea for me is interesting because for the languages that I'm interested in, this can work because it means that you can have rules and templates at the same time. So you can deal with the issues of grammatical complexity, but also with, get the simplicity one is afforded by templates, right? So maybe this is just, this sounds like gibberish, right? So I'm, I'm gonna show you what I mean by this. So in the case of English, right, when you're trying to generate text, suppose you want to say um, X is equivalent to Y. 
So an X is an A. So essentially you can have these two templates, right? So you have X, you can insert Y here. But the problem is that as you would note with English is that the determiner A depends on the, the, the vowel sign of this letter. So if it's, I think, it's, sorry, if it's a vowel sign, it has to be an N. So it's an N, it's an X, but not an AX. Likewise, so you have to use rules to cater for this. Now, this is basic, right, in English, because you can always just say, you know, instead of having rules, you just do use two, two, two templates, right? Now, I'm not sure if there's anyone in the audience who does speak Bamba. So I'm trying to try to illustrate the issue here is, so in Bamba, if you have verbs, right, verbs in Bamba in pretty much all other, like what people call a bunch of languages, what you happen to have is, a subject concord and an object concord, these are affixes in the verb itself that have to agree with the subject and the object. So in other words, if you had a, an axiom that says A reads B, right? So you'd have to use this word. I will have to apologize here. I won't try to pronounce it because I'll probably butcher it, but you will have to use this word, right, to say read. But the problem is that like, depending on who does the reading, as in the subject, the this subject marker here has to be different. Does anyone speak Bamba? It, it turns out that most, most so the, the thing with the languages spoken in the country is that uh, they're more or less like dialects, right? So I, I don't speak them, but I understand uh, with, ah. with the chair or the other background that I have. So, but I, I can see some bimbas in the house. I'm sure they're there. <laughs> okay, hopefully, like, the, uh, you see what I mean by this is that, like, it's very clear for what I mean. Like, this is the issue. But again, to illustrate what I mean here is, just to extend it further, is that if you look at Isizu, right, which is the, uh, the most widely spoken, like, language in South Africa, uh, Actually, I think, yeah, by first, lang by first number of uh, first language speakers, right? So the word loves, suppose, for instance, we have concept A and concept B, and you want to say that in your ontology that A loves B. So when you verbalize that, you have to use the word we are tando. But the problem is that the subject marker, again, is here, and it depends on the subject. Likewise, if the object is different and has a different noun class, you may have to use different a marker for the object. And this very much, there's two issues here I've pointed out they blow up very quickly for these languages because they have multiple noun classes, right? So which means that you need to have rules. You can't just get away with the same issue here, which is having different, like two types of templates because uh, theoretically, right, in, in Sizulu, there are 17 noun classes, which means that the combination here are 17 times 17, theoretically again, but then the semantics here like, that limit that number, they might reduce the number quite greatly. So in other words, the idea that we want to use, the one approach that makes sense to all of this is to combine rules with grammar as suggested by this person, right? In other words, if you look at a grammar as a set of operations, these apps that take in words with their, with their features and do something, and what they do doesn't really matter for now, but think of them as functions that take in the words and the features and then modify them. We can then simply just say that this idea we're talking about, this mapping, sorry, this addition of grammar and templates is simply just what we call grammar-infused templates. That is, these are templates that, that also have um, uh, some sets of operations with the grammar. Now, what the addition here means, again, uh, I know I'm being a bit hand-wavy here. I never mentioned what the plus means. How exactly do you add these things? But we'll get to that because that's the core of the work, right? Is the addition, the nature of the addition itself. So. Again, as I'm saying that what you want to do, right, is to add. But because I mentioned that the language that I'm interested in are less resourced, the nature in which you add becomes important. And what I mean by this is that, like, it's very important to have a modular design because you want the grammar rules to be detachable. That is, if you've designed grammar rules before for these languages, you don't want to keep redesigning them when you have to build new systems, right? You want to simply just take the case and say, oh, uh, Dr. Perry there has already designed these rules, so I just want to take these ones and then, like, if say ones, I want to generate SOCA summaries for Bamba, take those rules, add them to my SOCA summary system. But then if someone else wants to build, like, a weather generation system for Bamba, there's no reason why they should also create stuff from scratch. Maybe they want to reuse stuff from some of the, the, the SOCA summary generation system, right? And this may seem as if it's hypothetical, but I'll show you an example that where this sort of approach has been used. In 2018, Gilbert and Keith had built a system that was generating uh, language learning exercises. So this is like, it's similar to those language learning exercises you get from a textbook, but except that these are not limited, right? They have the, you have a large number of them because they're computational in nature. So this was, they did this in a year. And the only reason this was possible, right? This building of this thing, which is one year is because they were using rules from, they were built for in Zulu verbalizers from the previous year. So again, this is what I'm saying, that the, the detectability is important. 
Now, within that context, then, I want to specify what the, the main problem that I have. The main problem is that while there are systems that pair templates and grammar, there has never been a person who actually assesses and categorizes in a systematic manner the nature of those two relationships between those templates. Because if we were to know those two things as to how the templates and the grammars are paired, this might give us some insight as to how to build multilingual systems in the future, right? Again, I wouldn't mention that the, the, it was clear from this example I gave you the beauty of all of this, right? So given this problem, right, what I have done is to create a model that is that is centered around two things that from two foundational kinds of relationships that I'm like relationships that I'm interested in. The first one is detachability. Detachability speaks to the idea we just talked about, this idea of being able to have rules that are reusable. The second one is this idea of scaffolding. That is, sometimes you want to have templates, right? But then you want to add rules that are specific to that to those templates that you cannot guarantee that those rules themselves are somehow general for the language, right? So an example that suppose I have rules that I know for a fact that they will work for my temp for my soccer generation system, right? But I'm not sure if those rules are general enough to be able to be applicable to every instance of the language. Then it makes sense for those rules to exist within the template, right? So those are the two key issues. So based on those two key issues, we define a model that are two relationships. The first one is attachment, which is represented with an A, this relationship. So you have the rules attached to the template. And there are two types of attachment, partial and compulsory. And the second relationship is embedding. It's noted, denoted by the E here in this enclosing thing in the, within this, this visualization of this model, right? So Again, it may not be clear what I mean by partial and compulsory, but I'll get to that as to explain exactly what that means and why you even need such a distinction between the first place. So what we've talked about, right, is that we have a grammar, which is simply just a set of operations, F, that do stuff to words and their features and then retain new words, well, potentially new words and new features. We also said that the grammar templates are simply just templates plus the subset of, uh, sorry, that's supposed to be a G, not an A. So it's a subset of grammar. Now, the two relationships then to be much more specific what I mean here is attachment is the relationship that exists between templates and uh, and the subset of grammar rules that, sorry, that exists between those two things. If and only if the destruction of the templates it does not result in the destruction of this these rules that we have in O. That is, I can have templates and the rules, but if I destroy the templates, the rules still exist. That's attachment. That is, the this exclusive there's no existential dependence between those two things now we want to be able to have two types of that attachment right the first one is a compulsory attachment and the partial this just means that compulsory just means that rules are attached to every single uh, in, a, in a collection of templates the rules are attached to all of them when partial just means that only a subset we have attached of the attached of attached rules rather right and then with respect to what i mean by embedding embedding simply just means that if I have a template and the grammar rule that are related to each other, we say that there's an embedding relationship between the two. If the destruction of the templates always and must necessarily always destroy the, the grammar rule as well, right? So again, coming back to what I mean, this is essentially like, I'm being much more specific about what I mean by this, this, this model here. Now, the reason why this is useful, right? Perhaps this is nice, because again, I can talk about what those relationships all day. But the reason why they are nice and perhaps they are useful is because once we have them, we can think about the families of systems that that support various uh, various relationships. That is, we can have rules that support only compulsory attachment. We can have grammar infused templates that only support partial uh, partial attachment. Likewise, with embedding or even combinations of these relationships, right? So, what I, let me show you an example. Maybe again, this is still unclear. That if we have a set of rules. Uh, of grammar infused, sorry, if we have a set of rules and templates, then it belongs to this P family. That is, there is no set of, there are no rules that are compulsory attached. Likewise, there are no rules that are embedded. They only exist rules that are partially attached. That is all. So that's what we mean. So once we have these two components, right, that is the types of relationships and even the families, now we can do something nice. That is, we can start by classifying systems. Literally, we can look at all existing energy systems that we can find and classify them as to where do they belong within this, 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 these families. So what I then did was to collect a, a set of 41 tools that I could find. So these tools pretty much had, there were seven linguistic realizers, 
So if you remember, I did do want to go back what that means, but that just means that refers to the stuff we we're talking about before, the template versus neural network versus grammar, et cetera, et cetera. But you don't have to worry about that now. It's not very important to understand what I'm, what I'm doing. And then we also collected five systems from this work, the one we were talking about before, the one from 2005. And then we also searched uh, for verbalizers, literally, by trying to find systems that support other languages besides English. And then we combine that with the uh, with a list we found from a like a lit review that was published a couple of years ago. So in those systems made up of all, I think there were 29 of them. Well, I know there were 29 of them because I wrote it there. So these are the systems that we had, right? So in total, uh, there were 41 of them. So what we then did after we had this 41 system was to annotate each one of them based on the method it uses to actually realize the text. So if you remember before what we had said, we had ones that use templates, some of them use grammar, for instance, we, annotate, we just annotate them with grammar. The other ones said uh, statistical methods. And then the ones that combined templates with grammars, we annotated them like this. And then systems where it was not sufficient, for instance, to get an understanding based on the reporting, because sometimes a paper says it generates, it generates text, right, but it doesn't tell you how it works. So these ones where we couldn't find information of how actually they operate, we just classify it as other. And then once we have this classification, this first round of classification, right? Sorry, this uh, this round of annotation. What we then did was try to classify the templates. That sorry, the the grammar infused template systems, the ones that belong here. Uh, we classify them based on where they belong within this, right? So essentially, what we found here was that um, out of the first annotation, nine systems were just templates, and these are the numbers for the systems. But interestingly, though, the nice thing about it is that there were about fifteen systems, which is the most systems were using this idea of combining templates with grammar, and then we classified them. And then what we saw is that most of the systems, sorry, most of the systems were belonging to this EP, that is, they supported partial embedding and, sorry, partial attachment and embedding. Likewise, the other ones, these were the ones that were supported. So again, I now I've simply said, just said that we classified them, but I'm not telling you how exactly that classification, classification worked. So I'll do that by showing you how to classify it by using a template from something called Round trip authoring. It's from a. It's from. It's a verbalizer from a larger system that was published in two thousand and eight. So how the system pretty much has templates. Oh, sorry. There is someone at the door. Can you give me a second, please? Sure. No problem. Oh, sorry about that. I'm back. That's fine. Thank you. Uh, this is one of those problems when you have to work from home. <laughs> like, there's nothing you can do to avoid this is the situation. Um, but anyways, um, so templates in the in the system we're talking about have they look like this, like this, like, like they look they pretty much XML, right? They look something like this. They have three parts to it. The first one is the in component, which you see here. It's pretty much an RDF triple specifying what the input is supposed to look like, right? And the second part is the output, which is this one, out. And then the third is the ignore if. Ignore if is here, but it's empty here. What ignore if says is simply that you ignore input that matches this under certain circumstances, right? That's it. But then we let's just turn our attention to the out component here. The out component has two things. The first one is the singular form and the plural form. So essentially what it does is it embeds rules for, for the singular and the plural. That is, this is what's embedded. These are the linguistic rules that are embedded. Likewise, it only also attaches rules from something called simple NLG. You can't really see here because you'll have to read the paper as to like why I'm saying this, but it's not really shown here. Is that some of those templates must use simple NLG for, like, for, for, for various things. So what we see here is that there is embedding and P. That is, it, it belongs to the EP family, right? So again, we've talked about these things, but the question I suppose was pretty much in anyone's mind is, why is this useful? Like if you have this classification, why, where do you use it? So I'll show you an example here with Isizul. So one of the things that's happening, right, with the semantic web is that people want access to multi multilingual data, right? So if you have these ontologies that also are, like that are pretty much available on the internet. It seems nice that you could just simply just attach lexical information to the, the various concepts. 
So you then you can make you can build systems that are multilingual in some form or fashion, right? Now the problem I have is that if you wanted to support a Sizulu within this like, multilingual semantic web, right, and especially to improve access, the issue is that we already know that RDFS. Uh, if I think um, someone, some people may know about this, but RDFS is something called a label and a comment. Like those are two properties. The problem, however, is that they don't really work because it has to do with what we're talking about. The, the thing I was illustrating with Bemba as well, the fact that there's agreement. Um, and there was a, a model called Lemon, right? It was built to, to be sort of used on top of RDFS, sort of. Again, I'm hand waving here, but be careful, like, be, just <laughs> stay with me, please. So it was built to offer multilingual support, right, on top of ontology. So you're supposed to remove, not to have, to embed the lexicon on the ontology itself. You simply have lexicon entries elsewhere, but you point them to the ontology. However, a couple of years ago, one of the, my colleagues who's in the lab did show that Lemon also does not work, and this was in 2014, right? So the one thing people have been doing, though, that's interesting, is that a couple of years ago, which is two years already now, someone created what is called the Bantu language model, right? And they created to support another South African language called Sikos. It's the second most uh, spoken language here by first, by first language speakers as well, and it's somewhat related to Sizzle as well. Now, in this case, right, Suppose you want to say this language model was created for Sikosa, so it is likely to be like suitable for Sizulu, but you don't know that. So what you need to be able to do is you need to present this model to an expert, but in clearly in a manner in which they can understand. That is, you want to not present them with the thing because this was formalized in OWL. And aspects like a linguist may not know OWL, right? They, they don't have any formal training in that. So it makes sense to present this in Isizul if they like that's the language that they speak. Which then means that, firstly, you need to be able to select the appropriate template language to use, right, or tool. That's where the classification scheme comes in. That is, given the scheme and the classification, which of those or of those like uh, classified uh, approaches used for generation can you use? So essentially, there are two options, right? So in the first case, if you don't really care about the usability of the grammar itself, and you can do with just a few templates. Then essentially what that means is that any tool pretty much that belongs to these families, the one that I mentioned here, that can have embed templates pretty much may be suitable, right? Likewise, and a different option now is if you really care about the usability of the rules, but then and then the 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 rules for non pluralization and even the ones for the conjugate verbs that were developed a couple of years ago in 2017 would be sufficient. Then it means that all the rules, or perhaps all the template tabs that belong to these families are appropriate. Now, on a practical sense, however, is if you were to even to look at the paper itself, um, I'll share a link as well. I think Lighten probably will share it on the page. If you look at that paper, you'll see the however that there's only one type of temp grammar fuse templates that actually belongs, that supports this Zulu. That is, it's something called patterns that was developed by Kate in 2017, and it belongs to the EP family. So it means that both cases, technically speaking, are supported because you have the EP here and the EP here. Now, I do want to mention here is that while both of them can be supported, depending on both of these needs can be supported, there's limited support for this one, right? Because it, that thing can only support, sorry, it can only embed morphological rules. That is, if you want to embed under ty other types of rules, you can't. So in conclusion, what I've shown essentially here is I've developed a model, right, of this pairing of grammar infused templates, sorry, of pairing templates with grammars. And then I've categorized all the existing systems and show you which of the relationships that they support. And then I've shown you, and this pretty much shows us that most systems by pretty much by, by any stretch that they support this idea of having detachable rules. That is, they may be suitable, some of them, for if you, at least you use this notion of teacher ability as a criteria for less resource languages. And I hopefully like all of that made sense. Uh, we can move on to questions, because I think oh, I'm, out of I'm out of time by one minute. Oh. Uh, thank, thank you so much, Zola. That was, uh, that was nice. Now, I'm ashamed to say that I, I, I spent, uh, spent some what? Uh, close to four or five years in the same lab as Zola, and I, I guess I never had the time to actually fully soak in um, the, the, sort of, the sort of work that Zola does together with, with uh, Professor Keith. But anyways, uh, 
a lot of interesting things mentioned. I, I should mention upfront that I had extended an invitation to some some people that are somewhat experts in languages just because I thought uh, they would pick up on one or two things, uh, but unfortunately they couldn't make it here. Uh, before I invite questions, though, I, I think maybe it might be important, Zola, for you to maybe clarify on what you mean by low resource or less resource. People might have, uh, or they might misrepresent that phrase. I think it's important. Uh, and then we can take in, or we can take on questions. Thank you. Yeah, um, so uh, that's unfortunately, while that's like a simple question, that is a very, very difficult question because um, part of it has to do with the official metric one uses, right? So in South Africa, we had, I think, a couple of years ago, make sure people know this, there was, uh, I forgot which country now in Europe, I think it was Sweden, they had an audit of the available human language technologies that they had like for the various languages that like spoken in the country. And so anyway, thing happened twice in South Africa now. And pretty much what was shown is that if you were to look at the numbers of resources that are available for these languages and compare them with say other, like with European languages, there is a, especially English, by the way. But the thing is, while English is a large gap, right? And that's pretty much true for every language. But even if you were to compare them with languages like German or France, or French rather, there is a very large gap in between the numbers of the tools that are available. So this is not just corporate, right? These are things like morphological analyzers, part of speech takers, et cetera, et cetera, that gap. Now, if the question is, uh, if the question should be asked here is, what is this number that a language needs to differ by in order to be considered like uh, less resource? Unfortunately, as far as I understand, there is no such number. It's just that like, if there's a large gap and whatever large means here is, depends on people, people I guess is, that's what it's considered as less resourced, at least by my standard. Yeah, and, and, and sadly, I think very few people actually get to appreciate that. Uh, so we come from a part of the world where for decades now, we've just decided to adopt English as like the language of instruction. So all documents are essentially written in English, right? Uh, but the case for South Africa is different for people in the room. The case for South Africa is different because uh, I think last time I checked, they had a total of, is it, 11 official languages, is it 11? Yeah. Um, we might reach here. Yeah, so, we do so have that, 11 that official that languages. Way. But again, even with that though, I do want to warn you that is, while the state says there are 11 official languages, right? And then generally speaking, and then much more generally, there are 25 languages which it claims that it will foster and support, right? Again, we don't, we're not a rich country, right? So it can only support languages as far as money can stretch, right? So if money is not available, then certain things have to, like generally speaking, right? So if something ever happens that there's money that's lacking, so certain things just fall by the wayside. So for instance, what I mean by this is, we had centers here that were responsible for, it, they were pretty much called like a coordinated, right? They were called the National Lexicographic Union. So they were pretty much for building like a lexicon of the language, building dictionaries, that sort of thing. But they tend to not be as active because they are not getting money at the same level, especially now. So it's not as if like we are any different. By law, technically speaking, maybe we are different, but by practice, unfortunately, because of constraints, we may pretty much be the same as Zambia. Hello? All right. Uh... Questions, people. Zola is uh, uh, available for questions. Yeah, um, don't be scared. Ask anything. <laughs> I think we have extremely smart people in the room here, so I, I don't think they'll be scared. But are there any questions? 